So right now I'm standing at Wilder Tower. It was actually built in honor of John T. Wilder. He was a colonel of the Lightning Brigade that served at this location during the battle. Um, this monument was actually erected later in, uh, in honor of him and the men that fought in his unit. Wilder's brigade um, was positioned at here at Rosecrans old headquarters which was where he occupied on the first day of battle then he eventually moved his headquarters to uh, where it was when it was attacked um, by Longstreet's division with Bush well, Longstreet's men and Bushrod Johnson's division coming across the uh, the uh, field there to it. This was on the left flank of the Confederate line and on the right flank of the um, of the Union line. And uh, Wilder had a fast moving lightning brigade. Um, they were fast moving because they used horses to get the uh, infantry in position and then uh, uh, they would leap off the horses and fight uh, uh, basically infantry style but they were fast moving across the battlefield because of the horses. They also carried seven shot Spencer repeating rifles. Um, these rifles were bought by uh, the men in the brigade's own money and it was far superior in firepower to the muzzle loaders that the Confederates had and most of the Union had as well. Um, and uh, the brilliance of this was um, the Confederates came here and assaulted this right flank um, and Wilder was able to push them back the whole way, the advancing Confederates, the whole way to Lafayette Road, um, which at the time was basically the only positive thing that actually occurred to the Union at, uh, at in this battle. And uh, he had about 2,200 men in, in, in this Lightning Brigade, and they were able to push the uh, Confederates the whole way to, to Lafayette Road, uh, which was where the battle started that morning. So they were doing very well, uh, Wilder's Brigade, and they were actually had a chance to uh, take advantage uh, of the battle by attacking Longstreet's rear. Um, Longstreet was moving north and he was, Wilder and his brigade was coming up from the south and they had the opportunity to attack Longstreet. But Assistant Secretary of War Charles Dana uh, separated from Rosecrans um, command group um, after the, uh, the attack that uh, hit Rosecrans headquarters. He was scared out of his mind and being this close to the battle um, he needed to get out. So he, he actually rode up to Wilder and he ordered him to escort him back to Chattanooga to safety, this politician. And uh, rather than attack Longstreet's rear, while, like Wilder originally intended, he had to use his 2,200 man brigade, 2,200 men, to act as a personal escort and bodyguard service for one politician. So the question that has boggled historians' minds over this whole deal is what happened if Wilder was able to attack uh, or was able to attack Longstreet's rear? Could have the battle ended differently? We don't know. Thanks to Assistant Secretary of War, Charles Dana. Hi. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> so you guys are my hiking buddies today? Yeah. All right. And Ginger too. And Ginger too. You can't forget Ginger. Yep. <laughs> Ginger is a puppy. So now I'm standing in front of the monument for the 15th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Um, these are actually Pennsylvanians who were here at the headquarters of Rosecrans um, during the second day of battle, and uh, they would help defend against it against the oncoming um, onslaught of Confederates that were uh, marching towards them. Rosecrans went to see Sheraton and, uh, and check on his white right wing. His right wing was in retreat in the south. So Rosecrans needed to find General Thomas, who was in the north on the left flank. All right, And he's the one that had a third of the army uh, uh, go, go to him. And, uh, and uh, one reason why there was a hole in the line. So he couldn't ride north. Rosecrans couldn't ride north because he, there was a Confederate army that just chugged right through his line and was taking over the main road here. So um, he, to avoid enemy fire, he had to take a five-mile detour um, down roads further west from this location. Now, um, with him were a few members of uh, his headquarters staff, uh, including Brigadier General James A. Garfield, who was his chief of staff. Now at 2 p.m., um, the party actually made it north 
to a little town called Rossville, Georgia. And they made it to a crossroads. One road led to Chattanooga, Tennessee. The other one led right back to the battlefield and to Thomas. And Rosecrans decided that he was going to go to Thomas. Okay, so he was going to go to Thomas and he was going to give him orders to stand his ground long enough that they can uh, uh, retreat and get the army out of here and get it back to Chattanooga. And then he told Garfield a uh, whole mess of orders and uh, involved uh, uh, moving the trains in the certain positions and, and uh, um, getting people in certain positions to defend Chattanooga. And it was just a whole list of orders. But Garfield, he, he said, he said, well, I'm, I'll run back to Chattanooga and I'll give them orders for you, but um, it's, uh, it's a lot of orders. I, I might forget some of them. So Garfield made the suggestion to Rosecrans, well, why don't you, since you know all the orders, go back to Chattanooga and give them orders and I'll run back to the battlefield. The chief of staff, Garfield, will run back to the battlefield and tell Thomas what to do, hold the ground. That was an easier thing for him to remember. And Rosecrans agreed to it. So Rosecrans left the battlefield. The head general of the Union Army leaves the battlefield and goes to Chattanooga, Tennessee. He would eventually be relieved of command for this action. Now Garfield, he returned to the battlefield and eventually um, told Thomas to stand his ground. He eventually became the President of the United States. So here I'm standing on a hill. This would be more on the center of the uh, of the Union line. And over there is the Lafayette Road, if you can see it, and the tree line's on just on the other side of Lafayette Road. And here in this commanding position set a whole mess of artillery pieces. Eventually, I think there was 26 in all. But there's a Major John Mendenhall, and he led a battery here. Um, and uh, he was joined by other batteries. One of these batteries being the Battery B of the 26th Pennsylvania Light Artillery, which sat at this position right here. Now, um, Confederate Bushrod Johnson actually uh, took the opportunity to advance on these cannons with the idea of capturing them. Now, keep in mind, uh, when Mendenhall was up here, he ordered the batteries not to fire until you see the men coming from the trees. The problem is, by the time they were coming from the trees, Longstreet's uh, group was coming from the right flank, and they were outflanking the position here. Now, the problem is, is this battery uh, had uh, cannoneers and all that, but it didn't have a lot of infantry to back them up, which is an unfortunate thing because you need the infantry to back yourself up against that kind of stuff. They fired all their canisters according to the sign, that this battery from Pennsylvania, and uh, they lost 37 horses and uh, also uh, four guns when they were eventually captured. They were able to save, I believe, two guns, it said. But... Um, uh, General Bushrod Johnson, and I believe he was coming from the right, the right flank from over here, and he planned to take this uh, position. The Confederates suffered heavy casualties under the cannon fire, um, but they still were able to advance on the position. Now, the thing about the Battery 26 or Battery B of 26, the Pennsylvania Light Artillery, is it was commanded by Captain. Allenson J. Stevens. Now, why is this? Uh, Captain Stevens so important. Well, he was the nephew and ward of Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, Thaddeus Stevens was a senator at the time. He was a big abolitionist. Um, he um, was hated by the South. <laughs> and uh, he also had um, a ironworks and a blacksmith shop located at Caledonia uh, State Park today at, uh, um, in Pennsylvania um, between uh, Chambersburg and Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And, uh, but anyway, uh, Captain Stevens was this, uh, this Thaddeus Stevens' uh, nephew and his ward. And uh, Stevens, while here defending his cannons, was killed. Um, while trying to save them during the Union, uh, Union retreat. So the original plan for Bragg was to uh, start pushing the left flank or the north side of the uh, Union Army south with the idea of cartwheeling them around and spinning them so they're cut off from Chattanooga. 
that was the brilliant idea of Bragg, which it was indeed brilliant. The problem was he didn't account on the fact that Longstreet was going to bust through a giant hole in the Union line. That was completely and utterly accidental. So Longstreet now basically separated the right flank of the Union Army for the rest of the, the Union Army to the north. So he had to turn north in order to assault the uh, the rest of the Union Army. The problem is a third of the Union Army was on the on the Union Army's left supporting Thomas um, and so that meant that as Longstreet progressed he was going to meet more and more resistance. So um, that's basically what they ran into. There was heavy fighting and it was actually to the point where the Confederates might not be able to rout the Union uh, away from the battlefield anymore. It's not at least not as easy as what they were doing here uh, in the uh, or down at the right center. But here um, is um, a particular place just inside of a little wooded area uh, below where the cannons were firing from uh, Mendenhall's cannons in the 26 Pennsylvania with uh, with Stevens. And uh, just below that hill here and this is where Major General John B. Hood who John B. Hood was actually serving he served under uh, Longstreet's um, Corps, and he served at the Battle of Gettysburg. And famously, he was uh, led the attack on Devil's Den, uh, the famous power rocks at Gettysburg, of course. And uh, he was wounded at the Battle of Gettysburg, and he's still, after two and a half months of uh, after the battle, um, his arm was actually still in a sling, and he was here riding a horse and commanding on uh, his men with his arm in a sling. And uh, even and as he was commanding his uh, men, he actually got wounded in the upper thigh here, um, actually right here at this location, as the sign uh, indicates. And uh, he was wounded in the upper thigh, and he was carried from the field. He did survive, but they had to amputate his leg that night. So these soldiers, the Confederates, they had to march across these fields. And the funny part of it is, is these fields are not necessarily the nicest fields to be walking in. Now, granted, they might have been a little bit drier in September. This is March when I'm filming this. But if you look very closely, it's a, it's a, mo a moggy or a boggy mess. So uh, I've been uh, crisscrossing these fields all day. Uh, Luckily, um, the kids that I had with me, um, they were getting tired, so um, Grandma and Mom took them uh, back. But uh, there's no way that I would have brought them through here. I'd have to find a different way. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's an interesting trip. Now we have to cross this little beauty. And this is why, this is why you wear boots. <laughs> Even on history trips. So <laughs> yeah, my boots are a little wet. But that's okay. They can dry. So now I'm standing on Snodgrass Hill. This is the climax of the Battle of uh, Chickamauga. Towards the afternoon of uh, September the 20th, 1863, uh, General Thomas still held the left flank. The left flank was in the northern part of the battlefield. Now, the Union line to the south was crumbling because of the attack by General Longstreet. It was forming on a high ground at Horseshoe Ridge near a small house um, that was owned by Mr. George Washington Snodgrass and his family. Now Snodgrass and his family had to retreat and go in and hide into a ravine um, <laughs> away from all the battle and escape. But uh, this was uh, the farm in and around this house behind me here, which was, has been lovely restored by the National Park Service. Um, but this was Snodgrass's house, and uh, this is where his family um, um, lived. And then later on, the, as the battle uh, commenced around here and you had more and more wounded, you actually had to uh, use this as a field hospital um, to treat some of the wounded and do amp and amputations and things like that. But there were so many wounded here, it was, it was crazy. 
Well, anyway, um, with reinforcements coming from the north, Thomas received orders from Rosecrans, who is, of course, now in Chattanooga, uh, to take control of the force of these remaining remnants of Union Army from the south that is uh, um, that, that took position here on Snodgrass Hill and Horseshoe Ridge. And... Uh, um, and take control of them and make a stand in order to defend the retreat of the Union Army so they can escape back to uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. So we'll take a walk here because this is the actual farm, but then up here is uh, uh, an actual Snodgrass Hill. And as you can see back here, this was a hill too, but it's always being defended by the Union and uh, uh, constantly attacked by uh, Confederate um, soldiers as they were coming uh, up the hill. Now, the, the, they, the battle started to commence about 1 uh, p.m. And uh, it was in the afternoon, and they assaulted this hill. The Union, or the Confederates, assaulted uh, this uh, position, the Union position on, the, on this hill, uh, up until dusk. And they kept sending wave after wave after wave of soldiers, but uh, it, uh, uh, they kept getting knocked down, and they kept uh, uh, getting hit again and again and again. But to no avail, they could never take this position. And Thomas, being in command of this, um, was. Uh, uh, in charge of this whole defending the, uh, the this hill and the force and eventually the retreat. So luckily the Union held this position um, and Thomas was organizing the retreat as the as the night uh, uh, started to or the evening started to uh, come to a close. Uh, and because he was able to defend this position, Thomas earned the uh, nickname the Rock of Chickamauga. So with Rosecrans. Uh, relieved of command, Thomas was actually put in uh, his place. And he was the one who was in charge of the retreat to Chattanooga and eventually the, the defense of Chattanooga later on. But the withdrawal uh, and everything was uh, eventually under Thomas' command because of his stand here. So as I climb uh, up the Snodgrass Hill here, we'll go over the aftermath. So uh, the Union Losses were 16,170. So that's 1,657 killed, 9,756 wounded, and 4,757 captured or missing. Now for the Confederate losses, it was 18,454. As you can see behind me, this is the command that the Union had over the... Uh, the Confederate advancing forces. But anyway, Confederate losses were 18,454, 2,312 were killed, 14,674 were wounded, and 1,468 were captured or missing. Total casualties of this battle was 34,624, making it the second deadliest battle in the war, only behind Gettysburg, which had 51,112 casualties, roughly. So the Union Army of the Cumberland uh, retreated back to Chattanooga, Tennessee. The Confederate Army of the Tennessee under Bragg laid siege to the city, uh, resulting in many battles around the city for months after, after the Battle of Chickamauga. Relief forces uh, commanded by uh, General Ulysses S. Grant broke Bragg's siege and uh, forced the Army of the Tennessee to retreat and uh, opened up the South for uh, William Sherman's attack on Atlanta, which eventually burned, and his march to the sea. Despite being a military victory for the Confederates, uh, Chickamauga did not deal the decisive blow needed to destroy the Union Army of the Cumberland or the Union advance into the South. With Lee's failure to take the fight north of the Mason-Dixon line, and with the loss at the Battle of Gettysburg in July and the failure to dislodge the Union presence in the south at Chickamauga and later Chattanooga, Tennessee, 1863 actually became the year to mark the beginning of the end of the Confederacy and, of course, the Southern cause. Yet the war would rage on into 1864 and into the beginning of 1865 as General Grant pushed the Confederate forces to their breaking point. With the breaking of the siege of Petersburg and the burning of the Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia, the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia was surrendered by Lee in April of 1865, finally ending the majority of the fighting. 
Though the war resulted in the loss of thousands of lives and the maiming of thousands more, and the almost complete destruction of the society of the South, the war ended in a thing of beauty, actually. In many civil wars across history, when the rebellion was put down, the losing party was considered traitors and usually tried and put to death for their crimes. Though fighting would end in the Civil War, the bloodshed continued until vengeance was achieved. That's usually how history worked. But the American Civil War was different. Though some leaders of the Southern cause were arrested, the men that made up the Confederate ranks, mostly the small farmers and things, were told to lay down their arms and simply just go home and rebuild their South. Lincoln and Grant held no grudge against these men. They were Americans. Fellow brothers that challenged the government, just as their forefathers have done. The Civil War ended, for the most part, with honor. The country united as one nation, under one flag, under one idea, rather than a group of states. Before the Civil War, our country was considered plural, as we would say that the United States are, as in the United States are this, or the United States are that. But after the Civil War, our country came to be a singular country, not a group of states, a singular country, as we began to say that the United States is. Thank you for watching. If you ever get down to northern Georgia, please come visit the battlefield at uh, Chickamauga. It is a very nice place to be.